Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Dalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Umagyana Timirandasya Gyana Gyana Sharakaya Chakshurun Militan Sri Guravena Magyana Timirandasya Gyana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Guravena Maha Manjakalpatrubhyas Chakrapa Sindhubhya Evacha Patita Nam Bhavani Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Namo Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayati Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namne Gauratvishe Namaha he Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namustuti Tapta Kancha Nagaurangi Radhe Brin Sari Te Devi Pranamami Hari Priyananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shivasari Shri Gaura Vakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nastyeva, 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 Gatiranyata. Welcome everyone to this lecture, this week's Sangha lecture. Welcome. Uh, Shama and Sakirati, Brajahari, Govinda Mohini, Karolina, Krishna Kumari, and Saragrahi. It's uh, nice to see you, or at least see your names. Shamananda and Sakirati, I can see their faces. The others, I just see your names. But just seeing your names reminds me of, of you. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to see you. And now I see Karolina as well. We have changed the system. Um, as you know, here on, on the Tattva Vivek Lectures. So instead of lecture series, it's, it's individual lectures. And the theme of my lecture today, Bhagavata. Now, it will not come to a, as a surprise to any devotee that the Srimad Bhagavatam is a special book. This is something we hear again and again. And... Uh, very often we hear that uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam is the Amala Purana or the, the, the spotless Purana. We also hear that the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam is the, the Pramanam Mamalam or the, the spotless source of evidence for knowing transcendental truth. We also hear that Bhagavatam is the text to say, Krishna's to Bhagavan Svayam, but Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. So we hear about the Srimad Bhagavatam again and again. But uh, my experience is that not many devotees study the Srimad Bhagavatam. They receive at least not the Srimad Bhagavatam as a whole. Uh, most of the time, the Srimad Bhagavatam and So, uh, so apparently there's some some problem with the internet Probably freeze for a little while.
Okay, can you hear me now? All right, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I hope this will work better. Today seems to be one of those strange net days. So what I was saying was that uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam is a very special text for us Gaudiya Vaishnavas. But not that many uh, Vaishnavas study the Srimad Bhagavatam very seriously, at least not as uh, uh, in its entirety. We tend to focus on the 10th canto, and we do so for very correct reasons. And the 10th canto is by far the largest of the cantos. Uh, it's also the canto that focuses on Krishna's life, which of course is the focus of the devotion of Gaudiya Vaishnavas, whether it is as, on Krishna as a friend or Krishna as a lover. So it's very natural for us to study the 10th canto in particular. Nevertheless, all of the Srimad Bhagavatam is uh, important. And all of the Srimad Bhagavatam sheds light on the 10th canto, so that by studying the entirety of the Srimad Bhagavatam, we can understand the 10th canto uh, in a special light. This, of course, is something that Srila Prabhupada used to stress again and again. So in the lecture today, I'm going to speak about the Srimad Bhagavatam as a whole. Uh, and I'm also going to, to suggest some uh, uh, tips for how to study the Srimad Bhagavatam and how to, to understand the Srimad Bhagavatam. Some more kind of practical advice towards the end uh, for uh, Shamananda and Sakirati and for Saragrahi. This will not be anything new. These are things that they have experience of themselves. But maybe there will be something uh, for the others uh, here that will be, be new and hopefully useful. I don't think I'm going to go on for very long today. I hope we can have some discussion at the end, but we'll see. At the beginning of Kali Yuga, about 5,000 years ago, the texts say us, the sages headed by Shaunaka Rishi had gathered at Naimi Saranya to perform a thousand year satra. A satra is a special kind of Vedic sacrifice that, uh, uh, in contradiction to other Vedic sacrifices, can go on for a long time. A thousand years is a very long time, of course, by any standard. But this particular satra was being performed in the sacred place of Naimi Sharanya in today's Uttar Pradesh to counteract the ill effects of the age of Kali. The age of Kali had begun. And the age of Kali is an age of quarrel. It's an age of war, the age of machines, the age of iron. And in order to counteract the effects that started to pop out already by then, the sages decided to do this thousand year sacrifice. So every morning they would gather, they would uh, uh, stoke the fires, they would offer ghee, they would chant sacred mantras of the Vedas. And every evening the sages felt that they had done all the rituals, but all they got out of the rituals was blackened faces from the smoke, a hoarse throat from chanting all the mantras, and a feeling of dissatisfaction. The kind of dissatisfaction you can feel when you're doing something that you've done a thousand times before, but it doesn't seem to work anymore. You try to repeat things that have worked before, but now there's something missing. So they went up to Suta Goswami. And they asked him, Prayin alpa yusha sabya, kalavasmin yuge janaha, manda sumanda matayu, manda bhagya hupyadrita. Prabhupada translates this as, uh, O oh, respected person, or he translates it more or less like this, O oh, respected person, 
in this age of Kali, people are generally short-lived, lazy, misguided, unlucky, and above all, they're always disturbed. So what should we do? We're blackening our face with the smoke of this yagya, and it doesn't seem to have the intended effect. People are short-lived, alpayusha. How can you expect them to do a thousand-year sacrifice? They are stupid. They don't understand. They are unlucky. Even if they try to do something nice, the offering ladle will fall into the fire or, or things are not going to turn out as, you're suppo- as, they're, as they're supposed to. What should we do? And Sutta Goswami, we can imagine he sits on his asana, he's the leader of the rishis. And he says, this is the age of Kali. We cannot expect the things that used to work to work again. We need something else. So he starts telling about the Vyasa Deva. Vyasa Deva, of course, is uh, an avatar of Krishna. It's a partial avatar of Krishna. He's the one who, who divided the Vedas into four, again, for the benefit of the the dull-witted people of this age that can't learn the whole Veda by heart. So he divided it into parts, so it will be easier. Uh, He's the one who wrote the Mahabharata with the help of Ganesha. He wrote so many Puranas. But, Sutta Goswami says, Vyasadeva, sitting up in his ashrama in the Himalayas, in the Bhadrika Ashrama, he was feeling dissatisfied. He was feeling depressed. And he didn't really know what it was all about. But then something happens. Narada comes to him. Prabhupada used to call Narada the transcendental spaceman or maybe Prabhupada's disciples. So we can imagine Yasadeva is sitting there and being depressed and sad. And then from the sky, Narada lands down. And Narada, he always turns up at the right moment. You don't know if the, that it's the right moment only until maybe afterwards. So Narada asks Vyasa, what's wrong? Vyasa says, I don't, I don't feel good. There's something missing. I've done all these amazing things and people are saying, Vyasa Deva, Divine Vyasa. Uh, he wrote the Mahabharata, 100,000 verses. I worked together with Ganesha for such a long time. And Ganesha told me that he will write it. I just have to dictate and he's going to write it. He needed to break off his tusk, one of his tusks. If you've seen a, pic- a picture of Ganesha, one of his tusks is, is broken. He broke off his tusk to write the Mahabharata. And he said he's going to do it only if I never stop dictating. I can't take any breaks. Then he will stop writing. His own, the only time when he will take a break is if he doesn't understand something I've said. He's not going to write anything he didn't understand. So in order for me to get any breaks at all, I had to sometimes dictate really difficult verses. Vyasa kutas, Vyasa uh, Riddles. But I did it. 100,000 verses. And still I feel that there's something missing. Narada said, I know exactly what's missing. You have written about Dharma, you have written about Artha, you have written about Gama, and you have written about Moksha. But you haven't properly glorified Bhakti. You've mentioned bhakti many times, but you haven't properly given emphasis to bhakti. And he tells his own story, Narada, how he became Narada, how he was born as the son of a maid, and so forth. So Vyasa, he he thinks about what Narada says. 
And he goes into trance. He goes into meditation. And he has a vision of the Lord, of the Lord's energies, including Maya, who is uh, completely subservient to the Lord, but somehow different from the Lord at the same time. And then he starts writing the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then he teaches the Srimad Bhagavatam to his son, Shukadeva. There's a whole story about this as well, how, how uh, Shukadeva first left home after he was born. Shukadeva was a difficult child. He didn't want to get born. He waited 16 years in his mother's womb before finally taking birth. I've heard many pregnant ladies complain about children who are one week late. I wonder what they would say if the child would be 16 years late. So anyway, finally he's born. And immediately when he's born, he just walks away because he doesn't want to get involved in family life. In Bengali, family life is called shangshar, samsara. Uh, because it can be so captivating, it can be so binding that it's compared to samsara, the cycle of birth and death in general. But Vyasa, of course, he entices Shukadeva to come back by uh, teaching the people in working in the forest where uh, Shukadeva was staying. Verses from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And they would recite these Bhagavatam verses. And Shukadeva heard them. The sages, when they hear Sutta Goswami say this, retell this, they ask, why? What, what, why would Shukadeva become attracted by the Srimad Bhagavatam? It doesn't make any sense. Because he was already Atma Rama. He was already a person who finds pleasure in himself or herself. An Atma Rama is not going to find happiness in a beautiful sunset or, or happiness in beautiful poetry. An Atma Rama finds happiness in uh, uh, himself or herself, in her or his Atma, the true self. You can't. Uh, entice an Atma Rama uh, by offering some money or candy or whatever. Srimad Bhagavatam is just a book like any other book. Why would he be enticed by that? And then, of course, Sutta Goswami says, uh, it's not like that. Even Atma Ramas can be enticed by hearing about Krishna. And this, of course, is what happens. Even though Shukadeva is finding Rama or happiness in his own Atma, there is something that is even greater than this kind of uh, happiness of the self. That's happiness in hearing Krishna Katha. Dearer than the self is the Supreme Self. In the Brihara Arunika Upanishad, Sage Yagyavalkya tells his wife, Maitreyi, that the reason for, for why we find things dear is the self, the Atma. Yagyavalkya says that the reason for why a husband finds the wife dear or the wife finds the husband dear is not for the sake of the husband or for the sake of the wife. It is for the sake of the Atma. So the Atma is what we actually love. The Atma is what we seek. But even dearer, even more uh, fascinating than Atma is the Supreme Self. So Shukadeva, he's enticed back. He comes back to Vyasa's ashram and he learns from him the Srimad Bhagavatam. So we have already two different Bhagavatams. We have the Bhagavatam that Vyasadeva wrote. 
And then the Bhagavatam that Vyasadeva teaches Shukadev. And of course, this Bhagavatam will then be transformed into another Bhagavatam that Shukadeva tells King Parikshit. And that Bhagavatam, spoken by Shukadeva uh, on the banks of the Ganges to King Parikshit, who was about to die in seven days, and who wanted to know what the duty of a human being who knows that uh, he or she will only have seven more days to, li to live, what's the duty of that person? So Shukadeva says, the duty of that person is to hear and chant the glories of Krishna. And he starts speaking to him, the Srimad Bhagavatam. And in the audience of that meeting, in the audience of that seven-day Bhagavata Katha on the banks of the Ganges, between Shukadeva and Parikshit, in that audience, there were many sages. And one of the sages was Sutta Goswami. And Sutta Goswami, he then tells his version of the Bhagavatam to the sages of Naimi Sharani. So we have many beginnings in the Srimad Bhagavata. And a whole depth of stories, a story within a story within a story. This is one of the things that makes the Srimad Bhagavatam so wonderful. I don't know any other book that uh, has such a wonderful beginning, such a complex and beautiful beginning. Uh, the king about to die the sage, the 16-year-old sage who turns up uh, when the king is asking his question, what should I do? I have seven days left to live. And all the sages, they have gathered around this famous king, the grandson of the Pandavas. And they all offer different alternatives. You should engage in yoga. You should give donations. You should study the Upanishads. You should do, it, you do this. You should do that. You should make a big sacrifice. And while they are debating, while they are offering different op options like this, suddenly the 16-year-old boy turns up. What kind of dress did Shukadev have, Shamananda? How was he dressed for that meeting? Uh, he was dressed in the directions. Yes. Like that. <laughs> he was dressed in the directions, Digambara. He was naked, and he seemed to be a crazy person. I'm not sure if that would apply today, but generally, if you'd see a naked person in the street, uh, you'd think that's a madman. And that's what people thought. Kids would throw stones on him, and they would fart towards him and, and uh, laugh at him. It's literally said like this in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, but when he came there, all the great sages, Marichi, Atri, all of these big sages, when they saw him, they immediately got up, they stood up, and they offered him their pranams, and they asked him to come and sit in the middle. He had been walking around the earth, seemingly a madman, seemingly dumb and mute. He wouldn't reply to whatever people told him if they insulted him or if they glorified him. He would just continue walking. But now he sat down. Parikshit asked his question. And he started speaking. So all of these things, all of this background is given in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. All of this and much more. Of course, the story of how Parikshit ended up being cursed like this. Uh, but uh, from there, from the end of the, the first canto, uh, the teaching then begins. Something like in the Bhagavad Gita, how the first chapter is, is giving the background. And then from the second chapter, we get the teachings of Krishna to Arjuna. Uh, there's a, a, a famous verse or, or a set of verses that are attributed to the 
Padma Purana. Parau Yadiyau, Pratama Dvitiyau, Tritiya Turiyau, Katitau Yaduru, Nabhista Trapanchama Eva Shashto, Bujandaram Dur Yugalam Tatanyo, Kantasturajan Navamo Yadiyo, Mukhara Vindam Dashama Prapullam, Eka Dasho Yasilalata Pattam, Shiropitu Dvadasha Eva Bhati, Tamadi Devam Karuna Nidhanam, Tamala Varanam, Suhita Vataram, Apara Samsara Samudra Setum, Bajamahi Bhagavatasvarupam. The meaning of these verses is that the first and second cantos of the Bhagavatam are Krishna's lotus feet. The third and fourth cantos are his thighs. The fifth canto is his navel. The sixth canto is his chest. The seventh and eighth cantos are his arms. The ninth canto is his throat. The tenth canto is his, his, his beautiful lotus face. The eleventh canto is his forehead. And the twelfth canto is his head. I bow down to that Lord, the ocean of mercy, whose color is like that of a tamala tree, and who appears in the world for the welfare of all. I worship him as the bridge for crossing the unfathomable ocean of material existence. This Bhagavatam has appeared as his very self. Bajamahi Bhagavata Swarupam. So in these verses, the Srimad Bhagavatam is compared to the form of the Lord. And the different cantos are compared to different limbs of the Lord. The tenth canto, famously, of course, is his lotus face. And uh, if we had to choose which part of the Lord we like the best, we might easily choose the face. But I don't think any of us would choose to leave out some part. I don't like Krishna's arms so much. Or Krishna's navel is really boring. Or it's enough with one hand. He doesn't need to have two. All of Krishna's form is beautiful. All of Krishna's body is beautiful. Similarly in the Srimad Bhagavatam, every single canto is beautiful. Every single chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam is beautiful. If we learn to read it in the right way. Uh, the reason for why these cantos are compared to the different uh, limbs of the Lord is that they uh, speak about different topics. Purana, the word, means an, an ancient story. And uh, according to uh, Buddhist ancient lexico lexicographer, Amara Singha, who wrote a book called Amara Kosha, a Purana is supposed to have five topics. Now, this uh, description of a Purana, it doesn't really fit the Puranas as they are. It, it works for the Harivangsha Purana, which is sometimes said to be a part of the Mahabharata and sometimes a Purana, and for the Vishnu Purana. But for the other Puranas, it doesn't really work. And the Bhagavatam, for example, it itself says that uh, it doesn't have five topics, it has 10 topics. These 10 topics are firstly sarga, or uh, primary creation. It refers to the creation of the, the elements and the kind of basic building blocks of, of the universe. The second topic is visarga, or secondary creation, which refers really to, to Lord Brahma's creation when he's creating all the different living beings and so forth. Sthana refers to, uh, it means uh, placing, it refers to positioning of living entities in various worlds. That's the third topic. The fourth is Poshana, or the Lord's protection and, and nourishment. That's really what Poshana means, nourishment of his devotees. The fifth topic is Uti, or inclination to act. The sixth is Manvantara, 
or the reign of the Manus or, or the, the periods of the Manus. Seventh is Ishanukata, topics of the Lord's various avatars. The eighth is Nirodha or annihilation. The ninth is Mukti or liberation. And the tenth is Ashraya or the supreme shelter. So the Bhagavatam has ten, the ten topics. Uh, some acharyas have tried to show that these ten topics correspond exactly with the different cantos. But Jiva Goswami doesn't think that it's it's like that. Uh, firstly, of course, it would be dif- difficult because there's not ten, ten cantos, there are twelve cantos. So you can't really get them to, to map out on the cantos exactly. But they do correspond in, in uh, some ways. And that's why, for example, the, 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 these uh, different uh, uh, cantos are compared to different parts of the, the body of the Lord. Uh, but we shouldn't take it too kind of uh, slavishly. For example, the topic of uh, uh, nirodha or dissolution or, or destruction of the universe. That's um, the main topic of the, the 12th canto, even though it's, it's the, the eighth of, of these uh, 10 topics here. So in other words, the Srimad Bhagavatam it deals with a very large subject matter, 10 different, different topics. Usually a book will have like one topic. This book is about uh, creation. This book is about Manvantaras. Here we have a book with 10 different topics. And what makes it very special and quite interesting is that all of these topics are subsumed under the main idea of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Jiva Goswami, in trying to make sense of the Srimad Bhagavatam, in his Bhagavata Sandarabha, or his essay on the Bhagavata, six-part essay on the Bhagavata, or sometimes called the Shat Sandarabha, uh, he adopts a very interesting way of trying to understand, uh, trying to make sense of the Bhagavatam. And that is by looking at uh, the motivation for the Srimad Bhagavatam. Vyasa had written so many books already. Why did he compose the Srimad Bhagavatam? Well, this is something we already, I already mentioned. Because he felt the need to describe bhakti in a, a comprehensive way. Bhagavata, Bhagavata Purana or Srimad Bhagavata means the Purana about either Bhagavan, the Lord, or then the Purana about the Bhagavatas, the devotees of the Lord. In either way, uh, this Purana will be about devotion, about bhakti. So all of these 10 topics, they all are linked with bhakti. And this makes the Srimad Bhagavatam unique among the Puranas. Many of the other Puranas deal with similar topics as the Srimad Bhagavatam such as uh, the topic of Manvantara, or the different reigns of the different Manus. That's something that is mentioned in many, many Puranas. But in the Srimad Bhagavatam, this topic is presented from the angle of vision of the Bhakta. What does this mean from the point of view of Bhakti? Knowing about the Manus, that can be fascinating and interesting and And uh, uh, esoteric authors such as Blavatsky and others, they've been fascinated by this. And how does this map out on history and so on? Of course, that can be interesting. But for the bhakta, for the devotee, how is this relevant? This is something that the Sriman Bhagavatam shows. So the Bhagavatam is sometimes compared to Krishna's body, like this. All the different uh, cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam are compared to the limbs of the Lord. 
The Shimad Bhagavatam is also compared to the sun. A little bit later in the first canto, Sutta Goswami says, Krishna Sadhamu Bhagati Dharma Jnana Adibi Saha Kalau Nashta Drishamiva Puranarko Dunodita When Krishna now has returned to his own abode, together with dharma, together with uh, piety or virtue, and together with jnana, together with knowledge. And when Kali, the age of Kali, has stolen away the, the, the drishta, the drisha, or, or the, the eyesight or vision of people, People have become blinded by the darkness of this age of Kali. Then this Purana sun has risen. So the Srimad Bhagavatam has come, has been sent down uh, by Vyasa, the literary avatar of the Lord, to give light in this age of Kali, to give light to us people who are blinded by the influence of Kali. So the Shiman Bhagavatam sheds light on the topic of bhakti, uh, on the topic of what a person is supposed to do who only has seven days left to live. Guru Maharaj, our Guru Maharaj, he often says or, uh, that this applies to all of us. We're all going to die in seven days. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. In this way, we all have seven days to live. We don't realize that, of course. <laughs> Whether that's a curse or a blessing, I'm sometimes not sure about. But the fact is, we don't realize this. We think we have an eternity in front of us, or at least a very, very long time. But the Srimad Bhagavatam, of course, is a book that in many ways is a book about dying. Parikshit is dying in seven days. All of the, of the great kings of the Srimad Bhagavatam, they all pass away. All of the wonderful things that they did have crumbled into dust. What remains? The Purana sun, the sun of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it remains shedding light on... Uh, uh, how to live in this world. Now, Srimad Bhagavatam may be a sun, but it's not always easy to understand. There's a saying that uh, Vidyavatam Bhagavati Pariksha, for those who are, are, are Vidyavat or, or learned, the Bhagavatam is their testing stone. The Bhagavatam is a test of somebody's learning because the language of the Srimad Bhagavatam is sometimes very tricky, the Sanskrit language. And even when the language isn't tricky, the philosophy is not always easy to discern. Much of the Srimad Bhagavatam is prayers. As anybody knows who's read the Srimad Bhagavatam, you have these stories and then somebody breaks out into prayer. And you have a story usually of like five verses and then there's 20 verses of Daksha praying or Narada praying or this and that person praying. And it's not always so easy to kind of understand what they are saying. So the commentators, such as Jiva Goswami, they uh, have used different kinds of strategies of exegesis, strategies of interpretation to make sense of the Srimad Bhagavatam. There's a famous uh, verse saying that there are, are uh, six things that we can make, make uh, use of when trying to understand the meaning of a scriptural text. Upakramo pasamhara Abhyasu Purvata Palam Arthavaru Papaticha Lingam Tat Parya Nirnaye. The sixfold criteria for uh, establishing the meaning 
of a text are the introduct introductory and concluding statements, repetition, originality, result, glorification, and logical confirmation. So six different things. The first is the beginning and the end. Uh, what is the thing that is mentioned at the beginning what, and, and at the end? Uh, the second is repetition. Is there something that is said again and again? If so, that's probably something very important. Is there something that is original or special? Apurvata in Sanskrit. There has to be a, a point to a book. No book will be a simple repetition of everything that is said elsewhere. So is there something that is special in the book? Or, or in the, the passage of the book that one is trying to make sense of? What is the result? The pala. What is one supposed to gain by studying the text or the, the passage? Glorification or artavada is another thing, another way to try to, to figure out the meaning, uh, what is being glorified. And the final thing is, is linga or, or logical confirmation. So there are different, uh, this is one way of trying to kind of make sense of, of difficult passages or, or difficult texts. And uh, I promised that I would, would uh, give some kind of, of, of tips for how to study the Srimad Bhagavatam towards the end of this presentation. And I'm, I'm getting to that slowly, so don't worry. Uh, because the Srimad Bhagavatam is not a very easy text to read. One reason, of course, is that even though it's not 100,000 verses like the Mahabharata, it's still a fairly long book, 12 cantos, uh, 18,000 verses, or almost 18,000 verses. That's a lot to read. And much of the text is also not very easy to read. Also, the translation or the translations that we have in English, uh, most of them are, are translations that are done in a very traditional way, that every single verse is translated separately. And then there's often a, a fairly long purport to the verses. And these purports, for example, the purports of Prabhupada, they are extremely important and, and helpful in trying to make sense of the text. But reading verses like this, one verse at a time, and then a long purport that sometimes goes off into social issues or uh, defeating other philosophical schools and so on, can make for rather difficult reading. Uh, so how to read the Srimad Bhagavatam? Of course, we can do it in many different ways. One way is uh, something that is often re recommended for, for beginners. It was recommended to me uh, when I first read the Srimad Bhagavatam. And that was read the Srimad Bhagavatam every day for one hour. Don't worry about any studying techniques or anything. Just read it. Put in the time, open up the book, start from page one, and then you read, you read, you read, and you read. You read. And maybe you'll not get everything, but you'll get enough. You'll understand enough. And then when you finish the whole book, you can start again from the beginning. This is good advice, but it's also quite uh, challenging for most of us. It works for me because I'm a bookworm. Uh, I really like reading. I don't feel that I've had a uh, a real day unless I've, I've, I've got to read. But most people are normal people and they, they are not so crazy about books as I am. You can ask my wife, for example, she's going to, to say that I'm a little bit too crazy about books. But uh, how would an ordinary person then, then do it if they can't read for one hour every day? a book that they don't understand that much of. 
another alternative could be to uh, first read just read one chapter at a time and just read the translations to skip the sanskrit skip the word by word translation skip even the purpose just read the verses verse translations and then when you've gone through the whole chapter go back to the beginning of the chapter and then you can read also the purports in this way you will get like an overview of the chapter and then you can go into more detail i think it helps a little bit but one difficulty in the srimad bhagavatam is uh, the same difficulty that have 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 struck many readers of classical russian novels and that is that there's so many people involved and all the people have many different names how is one to keep track all track of all of this if you study these books for a long day, long time you'll know who is ajamil ajamila and who is ajamila and who is ajigarta and who is Ajita, and who is uh, this and that person. But if you're not so kind of uh, expert in all of this, these names will sound all exactly the same. One way to deal with this is to uh, note down the central characters of a chapter. Um, for many people, it's easier to learn if you don't just read but you also write. So when you come across a new name, write it down on a piece of paper with a pencil. You write, Aji Gartha, father of Shuna Shepa. You might still forget it, of course, but at least there's a little bit bigger chance that uh, you remember it. Uh, what about the boring parts? There are many parts in the Srimad Bhagavatam that are not only difficult to understand, they also feel boring. Many of the prayers, for example, it seems they are saying basically the same thing again and again. Oh Lord, you are the cause of all causes. You are untouched by the gunas. From you comes Mahatattva. From you comes this and this. After a while, it starts to feel like I've heard this so many times before. One thing you can do with these passages is you can think, who is saying this? Who is the person who is, who is uttering these prayers? Why is she saying these things? Why is he saying these things? What's the point? How do these prayers represent the person who's praying? Many times you can get very uh, beautiful realizations from this. For example, the prayers of Queen Kunti in the first canto. Beautiful prayers. Beautiful prayers that really reflect her own experiences as Kunti and all the difficulties that she had to go through. Uh, so trying to kind of think who is uttering these prayers and why that can help in, in reading, reading them and understanding why they are relevant. But I think even more important than that is to kind of approach the Srimad Bhagavatam with a sense of, of respect. That there's no chapter in the Srimad Bhagavatam that is unnecessary. There's no story in the Srimad Bhagavatam that doesn't have a point. If we look at these six uh, ways of, of understanding a text that I mentioned before, the beginning and the end and so forth, we will realize after a while that every single story of the Srimad Bhagavatam has a meaning. Every single story of the Srimad Bhagavatam, every of the different 10 topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam, they shed light on the main topic, that of Ashraya, that of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. By reading the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 
11th and 12th cantos, we will understand the central canto, the 10th canto. They all work to enlighten us about the topic of Ashley. Uh, and this is something that we can understand only by reading the whole Bhagavatam from the beginning to the end. Probably we'll have to do it many, many times in our lifetime to kind of get uh, uh, an understanding of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And our experience is probably going to be the same as the, the, the student that uh, Guru Maharaj sometimes tells about, whose, whose father uh, sent him to, to Varanasi to get a uh, Sanskrit classical education. And he came back and he was very puffed up and proud of his education. And the father asked him, uh, oh, good, you have studied so many things. Did you st study the Srimad Bhagavatam? Um, no, that, I don't think I studied that book. Okay, go back to Varanasi and study the Srimad Bhagavatam. So he's kind of upset and disappointed because he's thought he's finished his studies. So he goes back to Varanasi and he studies the Srimad Bhagavatam and he comes back. And the father asks him, did you study the Srimad Bhagavatam? Yes, I did. And I'm really happy that you sent me back because I had missed out so much. Did you understand the Srimad Bhagavatam? Yes. Okay, you go back. So he has to go back. He studies it again. He comes back and he says, now I've learned the Srimad Bhagavatam and I'm so happy that you sent me back because the first time I didn't understand it, but now I've understood it. Okay, you go back. So of course, the story continues like this until he says, I can't understand the Srimad Bhagavatam. And that, of course, is going to be the experience of anybody who, who approaches the Srimad Bhagavatam. We can understand many things about the Srimad Bhagavatam. We have some really good study aids uh, when we've read through the Srimad Bhagavatam once or, or twice or, or so, we can look at what Jiva Goswami does with the Srimad Bhagavatam. Jiva Goswami's uh, Bhagavata Sandarbha, or essay on the Bhagavata, is really like a, a, a commentary on the whole Srimad Bhagavatam, grouped into different themes. What, what does the Srimad Bhagavatam say, say about epistemology? What does it say about Bhagavan? What does it say about Paramatma? What does it say about Krishna? What does it say about Bhakti? What does it say about pure love, Preeti? Uh, so there's so many things that we can learn about the Srimad Bhagavatam. But we also need to be humble in the sense to realize that we can't understand the Srimad Bhagavatam completely. It's like the sun, the Purana sun. We can be amazed by the sun and wonder, feel wonder, feel the, the light and the heat of the sun, but we can't really understand the sun. We can't see the sun properly. Similarly with the Srimad Bhagavatam, we can understand many things of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We should really try to understand the Srimad Bhagavatam, but we'll never understand it in its completeness. Another thing that I, I very much recommend uh, for for studying the Srimad Bhagavatam, is studying the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, together with friends, together with devotees. This is something that we are doing here in, in, in Finland. We have a Bhagavata study group where we meet once a week. Shamananda Sakirati and, and Sargrahi, of course, are, are all members of this uh, study group. So we meet once a week and we read one chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We prepare, many of us, by reading that chapter in advance. And then we get together and then we read it together, reading the, the translations of the verses, and then discussing whenever there is something difficult or something strange or something that we don't understand, to see if we can kind of tease out some meaning uh, of the chapter. And at least my experience, and I'm not sure whether the other participants in the group will agree or not, but my experience at least has been that every single chapter has so much relevance for us as sadhakas, us as devotees of Krishna in today's world. Even the chapters that seem to speak about something completely strange and weird, we are now in the ninth canto, and, and there are many of these ancient stories in the ninth canto, uh, 
this week we had the story of of Harish Chandra and and the the human sacrifice that he he has to perform. At first, he's promising to sacrifice his son Rohita to Varuna. Then uh, many things happen, and finally he they buy a Brahmin boy Shunashepa to sacrifice him instead. So it's very strange and kind of violent and weird story, but there are many important teachings there, I think, about uh, affection for one's children, for example, and how that can turn into uh, something beautiful, but also into something that is uh, uh, destructive and and clinging and and uh, uh, that will cause pain to others, even though the, the idea from the beginning is is maybe good. Uh, doing something like this, studying one chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam a week, of course, is something that will take a long time. There's 335 chapters, I think, in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So that's plenty of weeks. And that's good. Because then it means that there's a possibility to create a, a community to come together for several years around one text uh, takes commitment, but it's also something that uh, creates commitment. When people come together, uh, they can, you can also have uh, maybe some kirtan, maybe some prasadam. That's a wonderful way to, to come together regularly and, and worship the Lord by engaging your intellect in trying to understand this uh, wonderful text. Now, you don't need to have uh, some special person to lead a, a group like this. We have very special devotees here in, in, in Finland. Krishangi, Kamalaksha, Saragrahi, Shamananda, Sakirati. We have many beautiful devotees here in Finland. But uh, not all of them have, have always been able to, to attend. And still we've been able to do these, these uh, readings. So anybody can do, do this. E even a person like me can, can take part in a, in a, a group discussion of the Srimad Bhagavatam like this. And I'm sure that every single of you, person uh, here, Karolina, Brajahari, Krishna Kumari, you could do the same. You could, you could uh, uh, decide together with your uh, local devotees to uh, uh, do something like this, to come together. If you have a temple in your city, you can do it there. If you don't, uh, you can do it in your homes. Just invite people to come and study the Srimad Bhagavatam together. I think this is a, a wonderful way of, of creating community and, and uh, uh, meeting different devotees uh, and doing things uh, live. It's wonderful to do things uh, online, like these lectures. It gives a chance for us to, to meet each other. And, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I would ever have met some of you if I hadn't had the chance to, to come together like this. But it's also very nice to do things in real life, to be able to sit down, to be able to hug each other, to be able to have prasadam together. Uh, I don't think I would be able to... to, to, to uh, to live as a devotee if I didn't have these kind of opportunities regularly. So I very much recommend doing something like this. And, and you don't need to have any particular qualification. You can just read the Srimad Bhagavatam, read the purports of Srila Prabhupada, read the purports of, of uh, any other great acharyas if you have access to them. Banu Maharaj, for example, has translated the purports of Vishwanath Chakravarti, Jeeva Swami, Sridhar Swami. You can get these books. Uh, I'm sure you'll find even pirated PDFs of them. Uh, so you don't need to, to invest any big money in, into it if you can't. And uh, just start, start reading like this. And the beautiful, one other beautiful thing with doing this in a group, of course, is that it, it forces you also to be regular. Even if you feel like, well, this week, I'm not sure if I have the time. If you decide that you'll do it every week, then you just have to do it and create this kind of 
time and, and space for it. Um, you don't need to have a big group either. Sometimes, uh, not very often, but during the years that we've been doing this in here in, in Finland, for a few times, maybe two or three times, it's just been me and Sara Grahi. We've still done the reading, we've still uh, had Kirtan and Prasadam. Uh, it's more fun when Shamananda and Sakirati are there and, and other devotees as well. But you can be two, you could even be one. Uh, but it's difficult to have a discussion if you're only one. So two is, is, is preferable, but even one can do it. So you don't need to go for numbers. You don't need to think that this is going to be the main attraction, the main Krishna conscious attraction in your continent or something like that. It's enough that it's two devotees who get to meet and to study the Srimad Bhagavatam and support each other in their study of the Srimad Bhagavatam and understanding of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So uh, this is one way of studying the Srimad Bhagavatam. You can study the Bhagavatam in many different ways, but this is one way that I, I, I've had a good experience with and I would like to re uh, recommend because I think it's not only useful for your own understanding of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's also useful for creating community, for uh, facilitating Sadhu Sangha, uh, and for also for learning uh, to to, to speak about the Srimad Bhagavatam in a relevant way. So again, I uh, uh, thank you for attending. I hope that you, you got something out of this. And if there are any questions or comments, then I would be very happy to try to answer any of them. Uh, I have a question that's not uh, exactly to this class, but to the Bhagavatam studies that we've been having, if it's okay. Sure. And it is, I, uh, I'm not sure if, if I remember seeing in the chapter about Sobari Muni, if, if he expanded himself into many when he had those 50 wives, because Krishna Das Kaviraj says in Chaitanya Charitamrita, that when Narada Muni sees Krishna expanding himself in Dvaraka, he's amazed. And uh, Krishna does Kaviraj comments that um, this is not like when Saubari Muni expanded himself, uh, because then Narada wouldn't have been amazed. Hmm. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a uh, very good comment or, or question. Uh, I also don't remember that in, in that chapter in the in the ninth canto, it would have been mentioned that Saura, Saura Bhari Muni expanded himself. But uh, maybe it will be mentioned later. Uh, or then maybe Krishna Das Kaviraj had access to, to another version of the story uh, somewhere else where that, that is mentioned. Uh, but of course, expanding oneself into many is, uh, is one of the yoga siddhis. It is uh, quite amazing. Just one second. I want to... It is quite amazing to, to, to do that, of course. I many times hope, uh, wish to have that, that power myself, but I, I don't. Uh, but uh, for a person like, like Narada, of course, it's something he's seen many times, yogis doing that. Uh, in the case of, of Krishna expanding himself to, to 16,108, uh, what's amazing for, for Narada is that these expansions are not just kind of copies of him. Uh, usually that's how these kind of expansions are explained, like uh, uh, reflections or something like this. So if one of these, uh, reflect, these uh, kind of expansions would lift its hand, then all the others would do the same at the same time. Uh, and of course, that's not what, what happens when Krishna expands himself into 16,108. They all engage in different things. One of the Krishnas is playing with his kids, one is engaging in puja, one is uh, with his wife, and so forth. 
there are examples of, of yogis expanding themselves into several and doing different things like Krishna was doing. So I think the reason for why Narada is so amazed is uh, uh, that uh, uh, Krishna is expanding himself into so many, doing different things, but also that all the queens feel that they are not dealing with uh, kind of remote controlled uh, uh, expansion or something like that, but they really feel that Krishna is with me, that this is the real Krishna. Maybe he's expanding himself to take care and, and hang out with the other queens as well, but the real Krishna is here with me. They, they really feel like that. They're, they don't feel that they are being kind of treated to the copy of Krishna. And this, of course, is something that Narada will find amazing. And he's finding it amazing because, of course, he knows that Krishna is Bhaktavatsala. Krishna loves his devotees. That's something that he knows. But sometimes we can still be amazed by things uh, that we know. Like uh, a person who, who let's say, has, uh, has read about the Himalayas, for example, that there are these huge mountains. But then you go there and actually see the Himalayas, you're still going to be amazed, no matter how much you, you've read about them. So I think that's also one reason for why Narada is, is amazed. He knows Krishna can do these things, but when he actually sees it, it's, uh, it's more amazing that he, than he thought. So I guess if Saubari Muni, he had uh, 50 wives, uh, if according to Krishna Das Kaviraj, he expanded himself, then uh, it was, would have been something, something of a more kind of uh, copy-paste uh, system. We have other examples of that in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, uh, Kardama Muni, for example, he expands himself into nine uh, to, to uh, enjoy uh, sex with Devahuti, to, to kind of really kind of get into it. Uh, so there are other examples of, of, of similar things in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Does this uh, answer what you were asking? Yes, thank you. Anything else? If not, I want to thank you, dear devotees, for uh, giving me your time. It was my, my pleasure, my privilege to, uh, to speak about the Srimad Bhagavatam like this. I hope I said something that was inspiring. And if I said something that was stupid or that you felt was uh, out of place or, or in any way offended you, I, I ask for your forgiveness. Jayam Vishnupar, Parang Supervraja Kachari, Ashtotar, Tashi Shimad, Hakti Vedanta Tripurari Dev Goswamaraj, Lagur Dev Ki Jai, Jai Nitile Pravishnam Shnupad, Abhay Chananara in the Bhakti Vedanta Swamaraj, Lapupad Ki Jai, Jai Nitile Pravishnam Shnupad, Bhakti Rakshakshi Dev Goswamaraj Ki Jai, Jai Nitile Pravishnam Shnupad, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Goswamaraj, Lapupad Ki Jai, Jai Gurki Chodas Pabji Maraj Ki Jai, Jai Shadidan and Moitakur Bhakti Vinod Ki Jai, Jai Vaishnava Sarvo Mashla Jaganatas Babri Maraj Ki Jai, Jai Gori Vrantachar Shlabalali Bidi Bushan Prabhu Ki Jai, Jai Vishna Chakra Tipakur Ki Jai, Jai Shiniva Shamananda Narottam Prabhutra Ki Jai, Jai Krishna Das Kavraj Goswam Maraj Ki Jai, Jai Vyasavatar Shri Brindavan Das Thakur Mashai Ki Jai. Jai Shirupa Sanatana Bhattarganata Shri Jibu Palavattara Shagana Chargo Shum Prabhu Ki Jai Jai Namacharya Shlahara Dasta Kur Ki Jai Jai Rai Ramananda Adi Gaur Parshavin Ki Jai Jai Prem Sri Goh Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gradhar Shri Vassar Shri Gaur Bhaktar Ki Jai 
Dash Yantar Dweep, my person under Dweep, Madi Dweep, Gudrum Dweep, Kola Dweep, Ritu Dweep, Chanu Dweep, Madi Dweep, Mother Dumar Dweep, Rudu Dweep, Makashi, Nav Dweep, Tanki Jai. Jai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gupta Gupi Kogu Vardana Dvada Savanat Makashi, Vrindavan Tanki Jai. Dvada Shopa Manki Jai. Jai Shamakunda Radha Kunda, Ganga Yamana Tulsi Bhakti Dev Ki Jai. Jai Shri Shri Purushottam Dham Ki Jai. Jai Shri Jaganath Paradev Subhadrus Dashna Ki Jai. Jai Bhakti Vigna Vinashna Karashin Shingade Bhagavan Ki Jai. Jai Pralad Maharaj Ki Jai. Char Vaishnava Sampraday Ki Jai. Char Vaishnava Char Ki Jai. Char Dham Ki Jai. Char Veda Ki Jai. Gurantha Raj Shri Mad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Jai Krishna Swarup Srimad Bhagavatam ki Jai Jai Bhagavata Mahapurana ki Jai Jai Karamatara Shri Chaitanya Mat ki Jai Tadiya Shakhamata Sumo ki Jai Shri Chaitanya Sangha ki Jai Ananda Gode Vaishnava Rinna ki Jai Bhuvan Mangal Harinam Sankirtan ki Jai Samagata Gaur Bhakti Rinna ki Jai Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bhom Shri Mandri Gopad Prabhu ki Jai Jai Ego Bhaktarin Ki Jai Haribo